Yes, as promised, I am back with a review video on Bridgerton Season 3 Part 2 from a licensed therapist perspective. And if you have not watched my review on Part 1 or even the one I did on Queen Charlotte, you should do that. If you are new here, hey! But if you are a returning subscriber, you already know how my review videos go. Full disclaimer, there will be spoiler alerts throughout this video. So if you have not watched Part 2 of Season 3, press pause. Go ahead and binge watch it on Netflix. I think it's like four episodes. And then come back and chat with us in the comment section because I need to know what y'all think about this. Let me know what are your thoughts about part two and if you're thinking about any type of prediction for a season four. For me, I think part one was better than part two. I know, I know, I know. I feel like there's a lot of people who feel the opposite where they thought part two of season three was better than one, but for me, my own personal opinion, I thought the first one was better. Anyways, I'll make sure I get into that later, so please make sure to stay to the end because I'm gonna give my final thoughts and my own personal predictions because the ones that I gave in part one were accurate. Your girl be on point. So just like we did last time, we are gonna take this episode by episode. So for episode five, it was called Tick Tock and not to be confused with the social media platform. <laughs> so in this episode, a whole bunch of things happened. We seen Penelope no longer being a spinster. She was floating on cloud nine. I just think she didn't know what to do with herself because she didn't imagine or see herself even getting to a point where she could potentially be engaged, let alone married, and especially not alone engaged and married to Colin. We see Kate and Anthony are pregnant. We also see Lady Featherington being a hater with Penelope per usual, being a raggedy mama, but we're gonna talk about her a lot throughout some of these episodes. We see Lord Kill Martin stumbling over his words a lot. Him and Francesca have a very interesting, shall I say, situation. And I'm wondering if there is some autism there or some social cues or some communication issues that are happening with Lord Kill Martin. I know a lot of you guys have said and stated to me in my part one review that you guys think that Francesca is on the autism spectrum. I don't know for a fact. The only evidence that we have is like her fascination with music, her wanting to be alone. She is kind of socially awkward at time and has social cues, but I can't really 100% say that she is on the spectrum. We see Penelope having a panic attack. We also see Miss Cowper, Cressida, trying to pretend like she's Lady Whistledown. What? We gonna talk about that because she saw an opportunity and the queen also basically put a hit out, a monetary hit out on Lady Whistledown saying, hey, if anybody finds out who her identity is and finds out who she truly is, I'll slide y'all some money. So there was a lot going on in this episode, but the thing that I wanna talk to you guys about the most is never giving up on the one thing that you desire. I know in part one, I talked about a lot with Penelope feeling down. She's been in society three times. She didn't really have any suitors. Nobody really wanted to court her. She just thought that she was just gonna be, you know, by herself forever, essentially. And out of nowhere, well, kind of out of nowhere, but really not out of nowhere. Essentially what I'm saying is even though her and Colin had a friendship and a relationship and there were some things bubbling up in between them for a while, I think this engagement caught her by surprise. She was trying to be with old dude, Lord Debling, right? And almost was married to him, but it did not work out. And so think about how you can see a person saying, oh, all hope is lost. Forget it. I'm done with it. And moving into the complete opposite, just like that. I also kind of want to use this opportunity to encourage the single folks now. So if you're a single and you're feeling like, dang, the dating pool really got pee in it. I don't really want to be with nobody or I can't find anybody. Dating sucks. Be encouraged that if you really desire a thing and you're putting yourself out there and you want the thing and you're putting in the work and you're putting in energy out there, the thing that you're seeking is also seeking you. So be encouraged that your time is going to come. Don't try to settle just because society says or settle just because you're getting up there in age and you want you know, to get married or to have children. Your time is coming, boo. Be encouraged. We also need to talk about Penelope losing her virginity 
this was the best episode <laughs> of part two. The other episodes, like I mentioned, was just like, meh, for me. But this was the best episode. This was probably the best sex scene that I have seen in regards to any Bridgerton episodes. Not because it was, you know, kinky and spicy and they were doing the most, but there was a lot of elements to this that we have not seen with any other couple. I've been telling y'all from day one that none of the people in society are prepared sexually are prepared for what marriage is going to entail are prepared about what goes on with your body what does sex look like like they just don't know anything there's no sexual education being taught with the men or the women so people are going into relationships blindly and if we're being honest they're supposed to be waiting until marriage but i don't think we've seen a couple yet that has truly waited except for francesca and lord kilmartin but penelope was an og triple og and by that what i mean was we seen her be very curious this is the epitome of trying to learn your partner this is the epitome of trying to learn your partner's body she said tell me what to do <laughs> i was screaming at the tv y'all i said oh my god penelope you crazy girl <laughs> I wanted to commend her because she was like, tell me what to do. Where do I touch you? How do I do this? What's up? She really wanted the strategy. And Colin was very patient with her enough to be like, well, this is how you touch me. This is where, okay, don't touch me there yet. We haven't gone here. Oh, I'm going to enter, but it's going to feel a little bit uncomfortable for the first time. You know, all of these things. First time in the Bridgerton franchise, we see a heavier set woman fully naked, right? Because we see Penelope's breasts, we've seen a full figured woman. And I think that that's actually beautiful because it's showcasing so many different body sizes, body types, body images that we don't typically see on the main screen. So kudos to Shana Rhimes, her team, and everybody else who intertwined this into the story. And if we're being honest, Penelope was a little freaky. She said, well, can we do it again? He was like, baby, I just got done. You talking about doing it again? He said, give me five, give me five to 10 minutes, Penelope. <laughs> and what this spoke to is men having a refractory period. So I don't know if you guys know this, this isn't a biology or physiological lesson, but this is why women, if they can have an orgasm, because we know a lot of women cannot, or it takes them a while to do so. If they can have an orgasm, women can typically have an orgasm back to back to back. Men can't necessarily do that without a refractory period in between those things. So this is why we see men need some time, right? They'll do their business, they'll ejaculate, have an orgasm, and then they need five, 10 minutes, sometimes 30, sometimes an hour, depending on the man and what his refractory period is. So this is why it's important to know your man, because if you have an orgasm and you had five and he just have his one and you want to go again, he might need a little bit of a break. But anywho, as I mentioned, I enjoyed this sex scene because it really just showcased the importance of learning your body, learning your partner's body, and just getting to know what you guys' sexual experience is going to be like together. And the third thing that I want to talk about in regards to this episode before we move on to episode six is Penelope's panic attack. I'm glad that they included some type of mental health situation in here, but Penelope's panic attack was a huge deal. We know that she was about to be oust. We know that she was about to be busted and revealed as Lady Whistledown, but she ran off. She started hyperventilating. She couldn't breathe. She was sweating, all of the things. And she essentially had a panic attack. And while she literally fainted and the doctor had to come and she needed to take rest, it was weird to me that they didn't bring that up again at a later time. Penelope had a whole panic attack and y'all didn't mention it. Y'all just like, she just needs her rest. And I mean, probably back then they didn't know that it was an anxiety attack or a panic attack or didn't have the tools to treat that. But I think that that should have been mentioned subsequently at some point in some of the episodes in part two. Now, episode six is called Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. 
And per usual, there was a lot going on in this episode as well. We see the Montrages trying to figure out if they're going to officially sell the club or not, and them prioritizing their family versus being entrepreneurial. We see them about to host their own first ball or their first party as a member of society. We see Francesca being officially engaged to Lord Kill Martin, which is an interesting match. We also see Lady Featherington kind of switching the game up a little bit and becoming a little bit more softer and more kind to Penelope and really showcasing her heart by telling Penelope like, hey, I never wanted none of this for y'all. I wanted you and your sisters to always do better and be better and have more than I have ever had. She kind of felt like she envied a little bit of Penelope because Penelope obviously has a love match and she was with her husband for stability. And she stated that. And so now that all of her girls are married, what is her life going to look like? But I'm going to mention that in my final thoughts. She said something very interesting to Penelope that I was like, whoa, this is deep. It's a very interesting mindset. She said, women don't have dreams. They have husbands. Yikes. I don't even have much to say about that, but I do know that Penelope's sisters were extremely jealous of her, and we do see a shift and a change for them and with them throughout some of the additional episodes. We also see for the first time, and I could be wrong, but we see a marriage at the church for the first time. I know everybody has been getting married and all of the things, but I don't remember seeing a church scene. So this was the first time that we've seen multiple church scenes and seeing people get married at the actual church. We finally see Lady Danbury and Lord Marcus's little confrontation. I know part one, I mentioned like, what is going on with them? Nobody's saying anything. Why do they have beef? Why do they have issues? And now we're starting to see what is going on with them and what was revealed was some stuff that happened in their childhood. Then we see some queer loving between Lady Tilly Arnold Benedict Bridgerton, and a dude named Paul. This episode ends real spicy because Colin busts Penelope as being Lady Whistledown. Woo! First thing that I want to talk to you guys about in regards to this episode is that family over everything. That's the energy that I felt throughout this entire episode. We see the Mondrages prioritize their family and their kids over being entrepreneurs and owning the club. We see Lady Featherington being a little bit more softer and prioritizing her girls and having conversations with them and just trying to do better and be better. We see Lady Danbury and Lord Marcus having, you know, their powwow and having their moment too as siblings. And so family Family is really important throughout so many different units throughout this whole entire show. The next thing we have to talk about is this queer loving that is breaking all of the rules. I was shooketh that Benedict Bridgerton decided to get all up in this threesome that was happening. I thought that he was going to decline and say, nah, Lady Tilly Arnold, that's not my thing. You and Paul could go at it. It's whatever. But he enjoyed it, and it seems like this is something that he wants to continue doing, whether it's with them other two or if he's doing it with somebody else. It seems like he does not and has no interest in really following society's rules, getting married, having kids. I don't know. He seems like he is just kind of like this outlier, kind of like a male version of Eloise in a weird way because Eloise is also like, er, to society. But I think... Again, I'm going to talk about this in my final thoughts and in my predictions, but I definitely think we're going to see more with Benedict in the next season. And last but not least, before we get into episode seven, I want to talk to you guys about lies and deceit. I mean, think about everything that Penelope has gone through to hide her identity as Lady Whistledown. And she had to do a lot of lying. She had to do a lot of deceiving. She had to do a lot of manipulation in order to keep that identity a secret. But in return, especially in this episode, it was kind of like she was messing up the very thing that she has longed for her whole entire life. It was kind of in a weird way, like she was having an identity crisis. She had to figure out truly if she was going to put down Lady Whistledown, was she going to embrace being a wife and potentially being a mother, what was she going to do? Because if she didn't decide and make it a definitive decision, you know, she could have potentially lost her whole entire relationship and marriage with Colin. 
And she could have ruined a whole bunch of other relationships along the way with the Bridgerton family, so on and so forth of the other people that are in society. Number seven was called Joining of Hands. And this one was all about Violet Bridgerton and Lord Marcus having a little thing, okay? I think Violet is a little freak. I think she's a freak -a leak okay? She's just keeping it under wraps. But we know in a previous season, she talked about how she wanted her garden to bloom and blossom and it still needed watering, basically saying that she still wants to have some good, passionate, intimate sex. I think she just suppresses it a lot for the sake of her children. But I think we are going to see some spicy, spicy situations happening in season four with her and Lord Marcus. We see Penelope confiding in the seamstress at the Modiste, right? Because remember, Eloise and the seamstress was really the only two people that know, and the printer dude, that she was Lady Whistledown. But I love that Lady Danbury and Lord Marcus had a little come to Jesus moment. They sat down, hashed out their differences, and really talking about how everything that they went through as a child impacted them today. They explained each other's perspective and side of views. And I think that they came to an understanding that, hey, we still good. I still love you, even though, you know, I didn't understand some things, but really it just took them having a conversation. It took them having a little chit chat and then all was well. We're also seeing the queen popping up a lot at events. I don't think she's popped up and went to as many events in any other season as she has this season. The next thing I want to talk to you guys about is how Lord Marcus was very direct. I think I really like Lord Marcus because he is not playing any games with Violet Bridgerton. He's letting it be known. He's a little flirty. He's checking in on her. He's finding reasons to pop up at her house talking about he left his hat and I was in the neighborhood. And it's just like, nah, you came to see her. Okay. And she was all excited and, you know, really sprucing up herself to see him. You can tell that she has an interest in him as well. And when they sat down, when he came to the house, he said, I want to pursue you. I want to court you. I want to see where this goes. You no, know, Violet was kind of apprehensive. And she's like, look, I need to make sure my kids are taken care of. There's a lot going on in my world. I'm not saying I'm not interested in you, but let me handle this stuff first. We love a man who's direct. We love a man who's assertive, not aggressive but assertive. We love a man who does not hide from conflict. We love a man who's doing what he needs to do. You know, he's a very direct person because he's directly trying to pursue Violet, but he also was very direct with Lady Danbury. He popped up at her house too and was just like, look, I bypass your servants, your guards, and I came in here because we got some bad blood between us and we need to resolve this. So I really like his approach. He's not with the games like everybody else has been. I noticed that when Penelope went to go see the seamstress, that the seamstress was low-key inadvertently trying to tell her, girl, don't you dare give up this column. <laughs> she basically was saying like, hey, I can't imagine, you know, not seeing my clients' faces and their excitement when they put on this dress. And she really wanted her to dissect and figure out if this is the right choice for her. And I feel like she was encouraging her to continue to still be Lady Whistledown and write and, you know, not lose that part of herself. But Penelope literally stuck between a rock and a hard place. You know, and I already talked about how the Queen was popping up a lot at these events. And if you haven't seen my review on Queen Charlotte, I'm going to link it up here for you guys to watch it. The Queen has enough issues of her own in her own personal life. So I don't know where she got all this extra time to be popping up at other people's events, all up in their business, trying to figure out who lady, like she has a whole bunch of extra time all of a sudden when she needs to be diverting that time on her husband and her own family. And the next episode, number eight was called Into the Light. This is where we see Cressida try to blackmail Penelope with money and we know it basically failed because she was trying to pursue and have a better life because she didn't want to marry the old dude. And she was basically trying to just be raggedy and it was an epic fail. We kind of see Eloise and Penelope start to build a little bit of a friendship again now that Penelope is married to Colin. They are technically sisters-in-law, so it makes sense for them to kind of at least have some type of cordial relationship. But we, we see them talk a little bit more, have a little bit more banter, laughing, spending a little bit more time together. So hopefully we'll see this relationship blossom a little bit more. We also see Lady Danbury and Violet Bridgerton have a conversation. 
It wasn't the conversation that I was hoping, wishing, and praying for. I thought that it was going to go into way more detail, but it seems like Lady Danbury was basically telling Violet, like, you already know what went on between me me and your daddy, right? (laughs) And without saying it, Violet was like, I know what happened with y'all, but my dad was a good dude. And that's all I need to know. They both express adoration for each other's friendship and admiration for each other's friendship. So it seems like Lady Danbury and Violet Bridgerton are cool. They know that each other knows about the situation. And I think that they're going to have a really strong friendship. So Lady Danbury giving Violet her blessings, if she, if she so chooses to pursue Lord Marcus, was a good and positive thing. I also love how we're starting to see the Featheringtons, all of the siblings, including Penelope and her mom, doing a bit better, right? They were, there was a lot of jealousy happening between them two, even between Penelope and her mom. Their relationship was very hectic and chaotic and her mom just didn't see her, so to speak. And so I see them softening up and being there for one another and giving each other compliments and you know, saying, I'm really happy for you and you were a beautiful bride and thank you for spending money, Penelope. Make sure that our ball was a great success. Seems like they're more open to supporting each other, which is interesting. So it took them all getting married and moving out of their mama's house in order for them to get closer. Interesting. This episode, we also see Francesca and Kill Martin actually wed. They had a private ceremony at the house, just them with a small close-knit family, which I think is a cool thing to do. So we seen them get married and she's basically going off to Scotland, okay? She's like, I'm out of here. I'm done being with this big old family. I can't even hear myself. I can't hear myself think. I want to be quiet. I want to be around quiet. I want to sit with my man in silence. Like she is, and she seems happy to kind of get away. And I think Violet Bridgerton is just very scared that her daughter won't come back or won't come back to visit or that she's so far away when she really should be happy and joyous that Francesca is finding herself and finding her own voice apart from just being her daughter. This was the perfect time for Eloise to soothe in and swoop in and say, hey, I'm going to Scotland with you. (laughs) And I'm not going because I want to be a, a babysitter, a chaperone, or try to be all up in you and your new husband's business. I'm going because this is going to give me the opportunity to get out, to see the world, to travel, to impact the world in a different way. I don't want to stay here. And so we're going to see Eloise travel. And I'm going to give my thoughts on her too, because I got some thoughts about Eloise. But we're seeing her travel and have a sense of fulfillment outside of just watching everybody else in society get married, have kids, get married, and have more kids. And at the end of this, what do we see? As I predicted, we saw that the Featheringtons were indeed pregnant. The sisters both had girls, but we saw Penelope have the boy, which means her son is going to inherit Featherington's estate. And it really worked out perfectly for the Featherington's family because that, uh, what's the dude's name? I don't even know what he is, a solicitor, an auditor, or whatever he is who's been coming and trying to talk to Lady Featherington about her estate and all the wrongdoings and the funny money that she stole and played around with. And so now I think that that's going to be kind of like water under the bridge because they do have a son in the family and he's going to inherit that name and the estate. So before I give my final thoughts, in episode eight, there were two things that really stood out to me. The first thing being that it's important to own your story. It's important to speak up. It's important to say, you know what? Regardless of what is going on in my world, in my space, I'm Lady Whistledown, okay? (laughs) And I am going to do what needs to be done, but also too, I enjoy being a wife and I enjoy being a part of this society. And I did all of this because fill in the blank. The way that Penelope owned her story in front of everybody, even the queen, was admirable and I think that we should take that lesson from Penelope and say regardless of what other people think about you regardless of what other people have said about you own your story take full advantage of the things that you have experienced stop trying to hide stop trying to be manipulative stop trying to be deceitful and just say yeah own up to it I did it 
yeah, and this is why I did it, and allow the chips to fall where they may. Authenticity always wins. Just be your authentic self. So whether that is a merge between Lady Whistledom and Penelope Bridgerton becoming one person, so be it. But what we essentially saw with Penelope was like what we would say today as a rebranding, right? So she's no longer writing as Lady Whistledown. She put that down, pun intended. <laughs> but now she's writing as Penelope Bridgerton. And I'm wondering what her writings are going to be like moving forward. But also to those butterflies that they let out towards the end and they were swirling around and flying around the whole entire party. I thought that that was significant of a transformation. When we think of what a butterfly entails and what they go through, I kind of feel like that's what Penelope went through. She was in her little cocoon. <laughs> she was going through all of the things. I'm sure she didn't feel uncomfortable. She thought she was going to be a spinster. Nobody wanted her. But then as she kind of just went through that process, that transformation, that metamorphosis, she wind up turning out to be this beautiful butterfly that was able to fly and people were able to admire the beauty of it. Like that was just a very symbolic moment. I thought it was a symbolic moment. So my final thoughts on this, and then I'm going to give my predictions really quick too, is that part one was better than part two. The only interesting episode for me was episode five with Penelope and Colin and the whole her losing her virginity. That was the most exciting episode out of this whole season. The way that they teed up the ending of season three, part one, I was like, season two is about to be crazy. It's about to be grand. It's about to be, you know, this buildup. And then when I watched it, I was just like, it was meh. Like it was, eh, it was just okay. And even though I like all of the stories and hearing different scenarios and learning more about each character, I kind of feel like there was just too many sub stories going on. Lady Tilly Arnold and Benedict, we got the Mondrages, we got, Kill Martin and Francesca. We got Lord Marcus and Violet. We got Lord Marcus and Danbury. We got, we have all of these different stories. Kate and Anthony. We have so many different sub stories that it was kind of like we needed more of Colin and Penelope. <laughs> we see more sex scenes, like real sex scenes from Kate and Anthony, from the queer loving that was happening, more than we've seen from the persons that were supposed to be the main characters of season three. So I feel like they need to chill out on all of these like sub stories and just let the story be the story. Let the main story be the main story. We love Polly, Penelope and Kylie. So my final prediction is that there will be a season four. I read that because it takes so long to record these episodes and these seasons that they are basically doing two year increments. Like because they have, they said it takes eight months to record a whole season. Then they got to edit it. Then they got to dub it down. Then they have to put it in different languages. Like it's just a lot. So it basically takes two years. This is why we keep having to wait long periods of time before we get the next season. So we will see a season four, but I think season four is going to be all about Benedict Bridgerton. I, I see the foreshadowing, right? Like Eloise was like, you know, I'm going to be back, you know, for mom's masquerade ball. And da, da, da. I said, mm, I see what they're doing here. Like building up the Benedict Bridgerton story, which is why we had so many sex scenes with him and Paul and Lady Tilly Arnold, uh, because that's going to probably be the main focus in season four. I still think that Violet Bridgerton and Lord Marcus is going to have sex. Clock that. I think they're going to have some hot, passionate sex, and we're going to see some really good sex scenes with them in season four. I don't know if I'm correct, but I got a feeling that after Eloise does all of her travels and she goes to Scotland and she's traveling and doing all of the things that she wants to do, she's going to get a desire to want to marry and have kids. I don't know why I feel that way, but because she was like all crying and tearful at the weddings and all emotional stuff, I said, Something is changing with her. Her heart is softening towards this. And I think it's hard for her because she's been such a stickler on, I don't want this. I don't want to get married. This is not for me type of energy. But I got a feeling that she's going to change her mind at a later date. 
I also think that we're going to hopefully expect some children from Lord Kill Martin and Francesca. I think that Kate and Anthony Bridgerton are going to stay in India and not come back. I also think that Lady Featherington, because now all of her kids are out of the house, and she ain't got nothing to do, okay? I think she's gonna start dating. I think she is going to eventually get remarried. And then I am interested in seeing what Penelope does with her new writings. Is she gonna keep it ratchet and gossipy or is she gonna tone it down a little bit and just give them little sprinkles of here and there of gossip? But you know, Lady Whistledown was a talk of the town. People were waiting to get those issues in those columns. And so I'm wondering how that will change with her now that she's a mom, now that she's a wife, but also how that will change society because it seems like they ain't got nothing else to do but wait to hear the gossip too. So thank you so much for taking the time to watch another review video. Please make sure to stick around and watch some other movie and TV show reviews on my channel. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you next time. Be blessed. Bye.